Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing today? Hope everyone's doing all right. So my name is Dr. Mohana Dalif, and we're going to be talking a little bit about patient psyche, veneers, tips and tips, to, tips and tip tricks to improve, and how we can improve the way we practice, how we can understand patients even more, and take our practice to the next level. So, one second, it's not going to the next slide. All right. So a little bit about myself. So. Um, Bachelor of Dental Surgery, graduated uh, from University of Sharjah in 2014. I've joined the private practice in late 2015 and have started my journey on general dentistry and cosmetic dentistry and veneers from there on. And since June 2019, I've decided to move my practice to the UK. I've acquired my registration with the General Dental Council in June 2019. I've had a couple of publications over the years. I have two publications and more to come, hopefully in the future, if anyone wants to have a look at them. So what we're going to be talking about today, we have, have a couple of quite things for, to discuss with you and so first of all we're going to start talking about the patient dentist relationship uh, from a psychological point of view and how it has progressed since uh, the 1950s from houseless classification and up until modern day after that we're going to be talking a little bit about porcelain veneers understanding what they are and what we're offering the patients and how long they last then we're going to move on to treatment planning important aspects of treatment planning we're not going to be talking much about preparation and things like that. We're just going to be talking about the treatment planning of it. Then we're going to go on designs of the veneers themselves, how we can make the perfect design to fit the patient itself. Each patient is quite different than the other. So how we can get the perfect design for each one. And then after that, we're going to be talking about the laboratory aspect, how we can have more communication with technicians, how we can get our message through as well. And then a little bit about the materials that we have for us to use. We have a lot of materials to use. We're going to go through some of the materials and in hopes to understanding what we have, trusting our material itself. So by the end of the lecture, I hope that we gain a more understanding of the patient's mental state, our role as a dentist, as a clinician, when it comes to talking to the patients and treatment planning, and to better understand uh, personal veneers and longevity of the veneers themselves, and what do we look for when it comes to treatment planning. And like I said as well before, the perfect design in relation to the patient, have a better communication with the technician, and then the material selection to get what we want in the end, because we, we have a vision of what we want to deliver to the patient, how we can achieve that, depending on the material that we have to use. So to start off, now this is something I think we're all familiar with, houses classification, we've all heard about it, we've all learned about it in our bachelor's degrees, so in 1950, House devised the classification system for patients that are going to be edentulous and getting their dentures and how their psychological reactions are. Uh, he classified them in four different classifications. First of all, we have the philosophical mind. Those are, of course, patients that they know they need the treatment and they are willing to take the dentist's advice and the treatment plan, and they're actually very good in wearing their dentures. The second was the exacting mind. Those are usually patients that have uh, bad oral hygiene, poor oral hygiene. They're very demanding patients and they require, they need a lot of guarantees at no extra cost. Or then we go into the hysterical mind. There's usually patients that neglect their oral health. They're not really excited or not really willing to wear dentures. And then the indifferent patient, those are people who completely neglect their health. They don't really care about their image and they're not really willing to do dentures <clears throat> since they've survived so long without them. So that was the basic classification in psychology about how we can pertain to the patient themselves. Of course, it's, it was good in the 1950s. There was no veneers. The aesthetic component was just dentures, replacing teeth into function and aesthetics. But it has, goods, uh, it has pros and cons, of course, to the classification. Now, the pros is it helped the clinician identify the patient the weakness of that classification what is, what is, uh, is that it was just taking the patient's mind in an isolated state. Just talking about the planning from a patient's point of view, but not taking the dentist into consideration. Uh, we all know as clinicians, uh, the way we perceive the patient, the way we talk to the patient, how we explain things to them, we play a big role in actually putting the patient in the mind state that we want. We can take a patient from being a hysterical, 
to put them in a philosoph philosophical mind state. But of course, those classifications are 70 years old now, they are out of date, and they require an update. Over the years, a lot of people have uh, proposed classifications, updates a little bit on how this classification. Now, in 1958, Jameson said that fitting the personality of the age patient is more difficult than fitting the denture. Uh, Oshia et al. in 1983, they said in their article that the ideal patient is compliant, sophisticated, responsive, updating a little bit on the terms of the psychology that House has used. Because uh, when it comes to house, some of the terminology has, is out of date and these days they are considered a bit judgmental, just like the hysterical mind. In 1989, Winkler discussed the need to fit oneself to the personality of the patient. Now, all of these people over the years, they have only discussed it from a patient's point of view, an isolated patient, which in psychology is not something that we, that is something that's known. So. The dentist part, none of them has discussed the dentist part and how the dentist mind state as well, the dentist psychology and how he approaches the patient can affect how the patient responds. So in 2003, uh, Gamert Buckin Garcia, they published uh, an article <clears throat> in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. Now they started talking about how the dentist himself and how the reaction of the dentist, the needs of the dentist, um, what we want from the patient has a big effect of putting the patient in that mind state. Of course, when you talk about professionalism, now the dentist, we would say, no, our needs are not really coming in effect. We have to be professional. We don't have any needs. We, we have to stay in one state of mind and just focus on the patient. But those are all subtle things that don't really come in effect. I mean, it's not really practical. We are in, in the end, as dentists, as clinicians, we are humans. We're not really just robots there just to go and drill a hole, fill that hole, or do the treatment that we want to do and let's get out. We do have needs. So they classified it as that, what do we mean by the needs of the dentist? And we as clinicians, we want to be liked by the patients. We want to be admired. We want to be heard. We want to be respected as an authority because in the end, we are healthcare providers. We're providing a service for the best of the patient. And of course, we like to feel in control. I'm sure everyone likes to feel in control when we're doing the treatment. And that's something we were talking about a little bit later in the treatment planning. And when we come to the laboratory issue as well, we, we need to be controlled. We don't, really uh, we, we don't really give the patient all the control. It's kind of a give and take between the patient and the dentist. So the patient has to relinquish some of his control. We have to give him some of the control as well. We have to give the patient some of the control in what we're planning to do because they are part of the treatment. And as long as the patient understands that and knows it, and when you show it to him, you will make a really patient for life. So they spoke about a little bit uh, about the factors that what affects the dentist-patient relationship. Now, the patient's ability to adapt to patienthood, the patient's ability to, and well, understand and, uh, well, understand that he is a patient in the end and he's, he's come to you for you to tell him what he needs and that he needs to relinquish some of the control over everything. Because some people, well, most people, we, we do like to be in control of our own lives. We do like to control of what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. Come into the dentist, we have to give the control to the dentist and they have to be willing to accept that part. And of course, the dentist responds to the patient's adaptation. Now, we might get a difficult patient, might be an easy patient that wants to listen, that is listening to you, to your treatment plan, what he needs to do. Some patients will not listen to you as well. So how we adapt to the patienthood of the patient himself plays a big part of that relationship. Of course, uh, another thing that's called transference, uh, they classified it. Now, transference is usually exhibiting emotions, drive, uh, fantasies, even defenses to, uh, well, to someone in the present, but related to someone else in earlier life, which can be inappropriate. So it's kind of living that moment again of that experience with that person that you've had. It works from the patient's point of view and the dentist's point of view, which is, becomes counter-transference. 
where you might relate to the patient as someone you've known, someone as uh, either it was a positive or negative experience. The patient, you might remind him of someone from his past or also can be a positive or negative experience. Those are all things that come into play when we talk to the patient. So that's why sometimes some patients relate to you as a dentist. They like you from the start because you remind them of someone they like. Some patients might not. Some patients might take you as an offense because you're a dentist. They've had a bad experience with the dentist in the past, so they just relate that to every dentist they will see. Of course, professionalism dictates that we control our emotions as practitioners, but also that comes in, uh, it's not really practical. It's not really something that, like we said in the start, we're not really robots. So when we come to talk about professionalism, yes, you have to be professional, but you have to take the patient's emotions in consideration, as well as your emotions, trying to controlling them as much as we can. And hopefully when we get to know the patients, understanding them, um, we get to, we're not saying control, but we get to understand and just work ourselves around that conversation to get the patient to where we want him to be, to be accepting. We can't win with all patients. Some patients are not really gonna be very accepting of that or anything that you do tell them. They're just there, they just wanna do the job. They don't really wanna make a connection with you. Just do the job and they just wanna go home. But there's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we don't take that personally. But on, on some others, you will connect at a personal level with them as well. So in their proposed classification, they were talking, they said uh, five different patient types. So first of all, they classify the first patient as the ideal patient. So they graded them as uh, from one plus to four pluses. So from one to four, one being disengaged, patients very disengaged, four being highly involved with you and with the treatment that you are proposing. So the ideal patient, now he looks at you, he's, he understands that you're an authority, you're a professional, you're there to help them, and they accept you in that capacity. They accept your treatment planning. They accept what you offer them, what they need to be done. So they, but they do have some questions, but they don't really grill you with questions. That's why they are ideal. They let you do their job. They understand everything that you tell them, but they do have some concerns that they would like to ask you and answer the question and that's it, get the job done. You build a nice repertoire with them, a nice relationship with those kind of patients as well. Now, the second patient type uh, is called a submitter. Now, this is something that we might all think we want. A submitter is a patient that really puts you, the dentist, on a pedestal, on a really high pedestal. You're the best I've ever had. There's no one like you. He idolizes you anything that you tell them, they will say, yes, do it. In theory, that might sound like the patient that we do want, but because they submit to us, they submit to you as an authority, um, they kind of lose the capacity to give you an informed consent form because anything that you do tell them, they don't really have any questions about it. They say, okay, I wanna do this, yeah, do that. Yeah, I wanna do that, do this. They don't question you, they don't give you any questions. They're not really an ideal partner when it comes to treatment planning, because that's what it is in the end. You and the patient, we are partners in the treatment planning. They have to be on board with what we propose and you have to accept as well if they don't go well with uh, what you propose. It's, it's a give and take kind of thing as well. We wanna be challenged, we wanna be questioned, but we don't really wanna be questioned a lot to the point where that puts us in a frustration mood. So those patients, they submit to you down the line if something does go wrong. I mean, in the end, dentistry is not really something that lasts forever. Nothing we do, all fillings, crowns, anything that we do doesn't last forever. Things can go wrong, either from a patient's side or it can go wrong from their, well, our side, laboratory side as well. The patient doesn't take care of his own hygiene. So if something does go wrong, you kind of lose that pedestal and you, might, you will lose that patient forever as well. So the third patient type is, uh, was named a reluctant patient. Now these, on the grading system, they have been on a mid range between engagedness and trust, uh, trustworthiness as well when they give you the trust. So, but they are the kind of patients that have uh, kind of given up on themselves. They've had problems with all their life. They've had dental problems ever since they were kids. They've been in and out in dentist office, probably gone to a couple of dentists 
problems still keep coming. So they kind of gave up hope on, well, on what can be done to them. But they are engaged. They will let you do their work, but they're not really hopeful on that if this will work or not. They will follow your instructions. So they'd still fall into the category of, all right, these are patients that are very good. Not very good, but they are at the med median line of what we want from the patient. Uh, the fourth patient type is the indifferent patient. Now, these have been classified as the lowest. Uh, they're not really engaging with you. They don't really give you any trust. They've had also problems in the past. Dentists that have been a disappointment, some work that have been done, dentists that haven't treated them well. Uh, it's, it's, these are stories that you hear from patients. I mean, one time I've heard a patient tell me a story is that they had their teeth taken out couple of years ago and the dentist had to actually put their knee on the patient's chest. Of course, now that's not something that we do want to do, even no matter how hard an extraction gets to, but that traumatizes the patient. That will make them not like the dentist. Um, they see us the same way as well. I'm sure this is something that every, we've all experienced in our practice. The patient comes in, he's new or she is new, you never seen them before, they come and sit down and the first thing that comes out of the mouth, they're like, yeah, you're, I hate you, I don't like dentists, and I hate you. And you just sit there, it's like, I haven't, you haven't even met. I mean, they mean well by it. They tell you, all right, you might be a nice person, but as a dentist, I'm not really a big fan of you dentists as well. Those are the hardest kind of patients to get them around to like us, and they're the ones that require a lot of work as well, because they have lost their trust in dentists. They have lost their trust in a all dentists and when it comes to healthcare and professionalism. So they won't really give you a second thought. They were like, yeah, you're a dentist like any other, do the work. Yeah, we'll listen, I'll follow the instructions, but yeah, I'm only here because a family member or their peers have actually gotten to push them to go to the dentist. That's how they're in different type kind of works. And these are this one that we will, you will need to work a lot on to actually get to your side, gain their trust talk to them. You don't have to do work on them from the start. If you see the patient is falls into that category, all right, you're in pain, we'll give you some antibiotics, we'll see what, how we can control the pain, take the treatment in stages, try to build that trust, try to build that confidence from that patient, let him like you. And you can actually make that indifferent patient and probably get him to a reluctant and down the line, they can become an ideal patient. It's all about just building that trust, which goes over time. The kids cannot happen overnight. So the fifth patient type, when we talk about is the resistant patient. Now they are highly engaged, but they are, they look at you as an authority type. Um, they think of you as someone just, those are most people that are against authority in general. So don't take that personally in general against you or the government or the police or anything at all, they are against authority. Um, like, well, they see you as someone who just wants to do the work and they see you as a dentist that just wants them to do what they, you want them to do and not take them into consideration. Being resistant is not really a bad thing. I mean, you can still get them around you as, as we go into that empathetic side of how we perceive ourselves to the patient. When the patient sees you as a person, not just as a dentist, things, wonders can actually happen. You become their best friend, not just their dentist. Because look, we, are, we as dental professionals, um, in our profession, in our career, it's not just, like, like I said, it's not just drilling holes. We make a connection with patients. We become their confidant. They come and tell you about their lives. They come and tell you what's going on and things like that. Of course, they don't expect us and we're not really there to fix everything in their lives. Sometimes those patients want to be heard and they want to be listened to. And over time, that can actually be very good. And so, and, but the resistant type at the start as well, they will grill you to the point of frustration. They will question everything that you do tell them. Anything that you suggest, they will question it. Why is that? Why is that? How long will it last? Will it look good? Uh, am I gonna have pain? Are you sure you're gonna do it right? And they really, really nosy when it comes to looking around and look at you, uh, how you use your materials, how you open your pouches, everything sterilized. They will question everything that you say to them. <clears throat> but like I said, you can take those patient types and you can 
get them up to an ideal patient. It just takes more time. It takes more patience. So these are the classifications that they have, talk, uh, they have spoken about. So when it comes to patient and dentist relation, now we go to you know, being a dentist, we have a role in the clinic itself. Now, um, well, mostly we are seen as an authority type and a little bit more of a parent kind of type as well. So you can be the parent who demands obedience, demands submissive from the patient, demand, or you can be a parent that is pleased with the patient or interacts with the patient themselves. Or you can be just a parent who doesn't really care. Do this, do that. If you don't want to do it, then that's on you. That depends on how you perceive yourself to the patient themselves. But hopefully, when it, when it comes to the clinic itself, it's all about how we perceive ourselves. We try and be professional as much as we can. We try not to get emotional with the patients themselves as well, not show emotions, but unconsciously we do sometimes give away some things. If we want to act as robots, we, might, we will miss out on a lot of hints or clues that the patient might say, or actually the patient might do unconsciously, the, the way they're moving their body, the way they're moving their eyes, the way they talk, the tone of their speaking as well. Is it a high pitch? Is it a low pitch? Is it a relaxed pitch? Those are all things and hints that gives us an idea of how we can approach that patient the best way we can. And uh, uh, that's what I hope and that's what my aim is from the lecture as well, is to give you the keys and the skills to get to that point where you can change a patient from being indifferent or resistant and making him an ideal patient. Uh, all of these have, well, the studies they have been made by behavioral scientists as well. So it's all behavioral skills. Now, these are things that we can practice at home. You can practice on your family. You can even practice in front of the mirror. Uh, when you go outside in the daily world after the clinic, when you talk to patients, at, so talk to people outside, when you go and have a walk. How you talk to patients, your tone of voice, your body bit language itself, how you sit in the clinic as well. So when you're sitting down, if you're facing the patient, that is a bit more personal. Now, if you put with your back forward, you are listening. So those are small hints that the patient actually uh, unconsciously can perceive. If you are a bit hunched forward, you're listening to them, they know you're engaged with them, you're interested in what they have to say, and you're taking that into consideration. If you are sitting way backwards, um, you're not really engaged, you just want to, maybe you've had a long day. There's no wrong way to do it, but everyone has excuses when it comes to how they sit. But when you try to, a little bit of uh, things that we ha can change and adapt into our practice from a psychological point of view, which is that's something that I really like, to be honest. That's why I chose this uh, topic in the lecture. I really like psychology. I really like to understand people. And I want to be understanding at the same time. And that's what we aim to, well, aim to have, aim to be. We want to be understanding. We want to be empathetic. But of course, after we go home, we don't really want to take all that with us home. It's all in the practice itself. It's kind of like it's selling yourself to the patient. In the end, we are uh, in, a, in, well, in a profession, in an industry where there's a high competition. There's a lot of dentists that can do what anyone can do. But it's where you become a bit more unique. That's where the patients will like you. Have a little persona. Have... Um, have a vibe in the clinic itself that makes the patient feel comfortable, feel at home, win over uh, a lot of patients. All right, I'm just gonna have a water. <clears throat> so, uh, first impressions, of course, when the patient comes in, he looks at you, you look at the patient's first impressions are very important. Uh, this is one uh, patient that I've uh, really wanted to put on just to have an idea. This patient, uh, I've had him in the clinic. He came in, he's a young lad. He's first time he comes in, he smiles at me. And all you see is that teeth and he looks at me. I had a picture on the wall, that picture I had on the wall. And he looks at that picture and he's like, I want my teeth to look that like that. But of course, as a dentist, first impression we see that, of course, we're thinking, we're thinking in our heads, it's like, are you kidding me with that patient? But it is a challenge at the same time. Uh, we might judge the patient. Of course, that's something we always try not to do and learn not to do. And that's, I hope not, no, no one does that. It's like, okay, you see that, you know he's bad. 
uh, anything that you do on him might not work? Is it worth working on him? But actually, after I got him in, had a nice chat with him. Yeah, he had a bad oral hygiene. He was in kind of the reluctant, reluctant patient type, but he's willing to improve. He was tired of it. He was tired of the, how his teeth look like. He was ashamed of his smile. He wanted to change. He wanted someone to give him a chance to change, to help him get to that point that he wants. So we spoke about it and well, we came to an agreement. We have to improve your oral hygiene. You have to get, take good care of yourself. So we temporized him. I told him, I'm gonna give you three, four months, go home, take care of yourself. And if you come back in four months and there is any plaque or there's any bad in your teeth, anything that's going on, then we're not gonna do the treatment plan. And he accepted that. He came back after four months. He, get, he took good care of his teeth. He listened to all the instructions I gave him. And we actually managed to put a more permanent uh, well, crowns and veneers and a whole rehabilitation on the patient himself. So it's, it's not, so don't be judgmental. We should not be that way. Always listen to the patient before we come to a conclusion. If a patient is willing to improve, give him a hand, help him. So when we're done from the psychological part, the point of view from the patient, the dentist's point of view as well, and I hope uh, if there's any questions, we'll answer them at the end of the lecture. The porcelain veneers. So it's very important to us to understand uh, what's the longevity of the porcelain veneers, anything that we do give the patient. Now, the purpose of this slide is just to show you a little bit that nothing lasts forever. Uh, there has been a study by Bayer in 2011, 94.5% uh, five years survival rate, 93.5% after 10 years. And they found the main reason that the actual veneers fail is the ceramic fracture. Of course, in some of those studies, they haven't taken into consideration many, many parts, but just, these are just to give you an idea of that veneers don't last forever. Another, another clinical trial was done by Leighton and Walton. It showed similar results of 96% survival rate and 91% over 20 years, which is actually quite good. And they have mentioned that the reason they have failed was because of the cement debonded. The cement reaches half-life and it, the veneer debonded had some fractures as well. Another study that was done by Burke and Lucarotti in 2009, they took a large demographic of patients and veneers that has done, and they found that 53% survival rate over 10 years. Now that is actually quite low when it comes to veneers, but they found out that it was done by the general dental service. So it's mostly fresh graduates, um, general dentists who don't really work with veneers as much because that's where experience and practice comes into play. The more experience you have with veneers and preparations and cementation, uh, you know your materials that you're using, the higher chance that you can get. So it's all, all comes down to experience as well. So there was another retrospective study by Shana et al. Now, veneers were done by undergraduate students in the University of Birmingham. They were supervised by specialists as well. But it found that the survival rate was 47% in seven years. So that is another thing about experience. Undergrads, we all want to do things when we're undergrads. We want to do this, we want to do that. But it's just uh, that little bit of uh, experience that we need to get over the years that we get from either going to lectures, uh, preparations that we do on teeth, amount of cases that we've done over the years. So there's all factors as well that comes from the veneer aspect and the clinician's point of view. Of course, how the longevity of the veneers also depends on the patient themselves, their oral hygiene. Uh, any habits that they have? Are they broxers? Are they clenchers? How is their occlusion? Uh, do they take care of themselves? Do they have any medical problems? How is their periodontal health, mobilities, diabetes? All these things they do come to act. So when you do tell the patient, if a patient asks you, or I want to do veneers, they're very happy, they want to do them, how long do they think, do you think they will last? And of course, when you take into consideration everything that you have around you, and of course, trust in yourself and in the materials that you're using, you should be able to at least tell the patient they will last for 10 to 15 years with complete trust that what, I, what you've done is actually the top notch that you, what you can do. All right. Dr. So Mohammed, comes, yeah. I'm sorry to disturb you. Uh, could you increase your volume, please? Or maybe if you could use earphones, something like that. Let me see, can you hear me better now? Yeah, this is better, sir. 
Uh, okay, I'll just be a bit closer. <laughs> All right, participants, uh, if you feel this is perfect, you could uh, say yes, that's perfect. And then we can start once again. Thank you. Oh, okay, so can you hear me? I hope everyone can hear me a lot better now. Right? Perfect, so we're good to start. All right, that's very good. Uh, that's right. Uh, okay, let's put that in. Okay, sorry about that. A little bit confused with uh, stuff. All right. So, after understanding how the long veneers can last, so it's when it comes to treatment planning and approaching the patient himself. So, we've talked about uh, everything else. Now, we want to talk to the patient. Uh, when a patient talks to you, they want to do veneers, either their peers have done it, their friends have done it, or they want to just improve the way they smile. Of course, every patient looks for value for money. Now, uh, we all know veneers are not really a procedure that's uh, cheap. It's actually quite an expensive procedure, and the patient is paying a lot of money to have that done to their teeth, and they want to make sure that they get value for money. So they will ask you questions. They will ask you, will you guarantee it for me? Will you do that? Do I have warranty on them? Now, of course, when it comes to warranty on that, every, every country is uh, different. Now, uh, I, when I was practicing back in the Middle East in uh, Dubai, we have had a contract with the laboratory that says they have a guarantee over five years. If it breaks, then we, they replace it free of charge. So that helps knowing what you can do in the, whatever country you're practicing in. Uh, in the UK, it's a bit different here. It's a bit, uh, guarantee goes on for a year. Of course, the guarantee comes in the patient that has to understand that you're giving them a guarantee, not just if they break for any reason at all. Now, if the patient breaks it by himself, then that doesn't cover under the warranty. Now, that's something that the patient has to know. If a patient uh, has a bad oral hygiene or if it includes decay, if the patient has missed their review appointments, their patient's not really, he's on the veneers, they've gone away, they come back after a couple of years and they're like, oh yeah, it's a warranty. And then you've missed all your appointments, you've missed all your checkups, that does not fall under warranty. Just like anything that you do buy, any electronics, everything that falls under warranty. Uh, but in the end, they want value for their money and they come to you, they expect you, when you tell them the treatment plan, they expect you to give them the utmost value that they expect from you. Of course, when it comes to planning as well, you have to listen to the patient. Sit there, don't talk a lot. Ask the patient what they want, what are their expectations in the end? what how do they want their teeth to look like they will tell you exactly what they want they will they have an image each patient has an image of how they want to look you might get a patient that tells you oh in the end i want to look like uh, angelina jolie i want to look like that i want to look like that that is something that's that is there they want to look like celebrities that they do like they want to look like that people that they like they see their teeth on tv they see their teeth on the news they like their teeth they want to have the same so listen to the patient, and if you can actually get that to the patient. Now, after you get everything that you need from the patient, we have to inform them about the procedure step by step. The patient has to understand that we have to drill, we might have to drill some of the teeth to get the result that they want. We might have to drill over there, your teeth might become a little bit smaller. Um, if the tooth is completely destroyed with a big filling, that patient has to understand that that tooth might be need uh, to be crowned, not veneered and always answer their questions. If they have any questions about any part of the procedure, answer the questions. There is nothing for us to hide. Now, the more honest you are with the patient, the more receptive they are to your treatment, the more cooperative they will be with you, and the easier it's gonna be for you to finish the treatment as well, and to finish uh, put the veneers in and the patient to be happy. Now, of course, the most important thing is that timeline. Now, what do I mean by timeline? Uh, if a patient comes in, you do want adequate time to plan what you want to do for the patient, to put, temporize them, patient likes them, go for the permanent veneers. There might, they might be a problem when it comes to the permanent cementation phase. You might have to send the veneers back to the lab. So it has to be a realistic timeline that we work with. As a patient comes in and tells you, I have two days, I have a wedding in two days, I have an event in two or three days, even a week itself. It's not really giving you much of a time or a chance to actually plan the case as much as you want it. Now, the ideally, for how, when, I, when I practice, I ideally want the patient to have at least three to four weeks of 
free time before the event happens in case anything goes wrong, we have time to fix it. We're not really rushing in the procedure itself. We're not rushing the technician to finish the veneers. And we're not rushing ourselves when it comes to the cementation. Every part of the procedure, every step in the procedure that we do is actually quite important. So we do have to take our time. And we don't want to feel stressed. We don't want to feel pressured because that will come out on ourselves uh, well, when we go home. I mean, I tell you that from personal experience. I've done it a couple of times and it does not feel good. You feel pressure. You give them the result, they might be happy, but in the end of the day, you're drained, out of energy, you've put so much effort in it. It's, it is an accomplishment, but you always want to give yourself some time. Uh, take your time when you plan the treatment. Take your time when you do everything. Don't rush things. So again, listen to the patient. In the end, the patient is the one that's going to have to have those veneers. He, the patient needs to be happy with those veneers listen to the patient it's a very important part uh, after that you have to there are a couple of questions that you you can ask the patient to get, get more of an idea of how you want to design the patient the way he wants it you know, what is their job are they are they health professionals are is it their doctors lawyers uh, judges is is their job pertains to talking to a lot of people being in out in public a lot or they, do they work in an office all those things, they do come in consideration when you want to design the teeth and what you want to give the patient. What's their age as well? Are they a young patient? Are they a middle-aged patient? Or are they an old patient? That can affect of how much glazing you do want to put on the veneers as a final step. Either you want to be a high glaze, a mid glaze, or you don't want to put a glaze on the teeth themselves. Um, because as we do know, as a young patient, a young demographic, you need a bit more glaze to make the teeth look younger, to pertain to their age group as well. When the patient gets higher, some patients want it to be glazed when they're older, but in the end, it won't look right. So it doesn't really look their age. And we have seen that around a lot. Of course, their gender plays a role. Now, if they're male or female, but we know as a male patient, uh, the teeth have to be a bit more uh, male kind of in their shape. Feminine shape as well plays a role that has to be a bit more soft. Look at their facial anatomy. How does their face look like? Is it round? Is it oval? Is it rectangular, square? All these as well, they come into effect when you're plan planning your design. We take, and then we take study casts. We always have to have study casts that we can actually build on. Of course, it's always good to have a replica, to have a study cast and a working cast where you can actually mock, uh, make a mock-up of the teeth, uh, build up the teeth, maybe send it to the lab, let the lab do the mock-up, and then you can actually show the patient of what you, what you want their teeth to look at in the end. So you can show them on the cast, tell them, all right, I need to, if you want to get the teeth like that, if you want to like the teeth like that, I need to drill a little bit here, I need to do that here, do that there, and see if the patient accepts it, because the patient needs to accept that they are, you do need to drill the teeth at some point, depending on their teeth. If they don't accept the drilling of the teeth, now that's where the compromise comes in. Tell them, okay, we might not need to drill as much, but we need to do this and we need to do that. That's how the treatment planning and discussion goes on with your patient. That's why it is a partnership in the end. You want the patient to be happy. Now, the most important part, so we've talked about patient's point of view, treatment planning, but the most important part when it comes to doing a rehabilitation procedures, veneer procedure, of course, it's an informed consent. You have to have a written informed consent that uh, says everything that you've told the patient in the clinic. So you've explained to the patient occlusion might change, you might have a little bit of sensitivity, um, the veneers might change color over time, depends on what you do, the teeth they change color, you're still susceptible to decay, they have to come to their appointments, their checkups, their follow-ups. These things are to protect you as a clinician because you are doing something major to the patient. Uh, the patients, they will come back at you if things go wrong. They, they are your best friends when it comes to doing the treatment and they're happy. But when things go wrong, that's when they come back at you. So the written consent form is actually a very important aspect to protect you and the clinic from any problems down the line. That the patient understood everything, you told him everything, he had the chance to ask you any questions or if they have any doubts that, uh, all about the treatment or about the veneers themselves, they had the option and they had the chance to ask you. You can add as well, you can add in the consent form if you want to have uh, the, well, the, 
how much it's going to cost as well to have that written that can also be added on there but when you do have an informed consent form it should not be biased as well it should not look like it's done just in the favor of the dentist well protecting himself it has to be point to point on what actually happens in the treatment themselves you, we cannot really add things that not really relative to what we're doing so when it comes to the end of the treatment itself and you put the veneers in or even in a trying phase tell the patient always to have someone close with them a close friend or a relative someone that um, they take their opinion highly in regards because you might done the work you've done a lot of work you've done the veneers you've cemented them in it's been a couple of hours you're tired the patient is tired he's very happy when he sees them in the mirror and he's happy with you gives you a hug goes home comes back the next day and he tells you i don't like them i don't like the color uh, i need to change them so what's happened there and they've gone back they might the first thing they do is they go to their closest friends they go to their mothers their family their relatives and they smile at them and the first thing they hear from the family members is oh that's too white or no i don't like the way your teeth like uh, teeth look like the patient might be happy when you put them in but they went home and that's it they're not happy with them because their friends don't like them so it's always good to have someone with either the guardian or a close friend with the patient come in when you're doing the trying phase let them have a look let them give the opinion about how they look like and if everyone likes it then that eliminates the risk of the patient coming back and telling you, I don't like them. All right. But when we are planning our treatment, what are the main things that we are looking for? Of course, the first thing is about what we need to know if the patient has any parafunctional habits. Is the patient a clenching? Does he, does he have bruxism? Does he grind his teeth? Does he clench his teeth chronically? Or does he do it periodically? Is he under stress? Those things can affect uh, the fracture of the veneers. So if the patient is a broxer, then we'll tell the patient, all right, we'll do the treatment, we'll finish the treatment, but then we need to do a splint for you in the end so you can wear. And that splint will act as a protection for his dentition, for his jaw, for his muscles, and even for the veneers that you put on there. Because we, do, we don't really want veneers to break. You know, we don't want patients to come back after the year tells you, oh, the veneer is fractured. Why is that I woke up with a piece in my mouth? It's not really something that we do want. It brings us down, brings the patient down. The second thing we look at is the occlusion. Now, what is the occlusion? Is he a class one? Is he a class two? Is he a class three? That will also depend, uh, that will affect what we do in the end and how we design it, how we do, do it as well. The lip line. So you tell the patient, smile. So when the patient smiles, and you look at the lip line of the patient so you can see you can see how they smile when they laugh as well that's very important it gives you an idea of how far the lip goes back uh, when you're planning your veneers now an, an optimum uh, lip line is usually two millimeters below the incisal level of the teeth but it can go backwards there are patients that have really big smiles patients that have really small smiles patients that smile with their lower teeth all these come into consideration after that we look into the buccal corridor as well so on the patient's breast smiling we do see the buccal corridor here on the sides over here now the optimum value for a buccal corridor is around two millimeters uh, if it's constricted if there's not much in the buccal corridor then that might not give you an optimum results in the end two millimeter gives you a, a lot of space to work with and when they smile that black corridor the buccal corridor is actually very important when it comes to a smile you don't want to give the patient in the end, you don't want them to have kind of a hoarse smile. When they smile, all you see is teeth and there's nothing in there, there's no black, there's no character to it. So always identify those things. And we, talk, we look at their periodontal condition. Do they take care of their teeth? Is there any teeth that are mobile? Take a panoramic x-ray. Do we have bone loss? How much do we have the teeth to work in? Of course, you don't want to work with mobile teeth, uh, from tooth is mobile. If it's a grade one, two, grade one are good to work with, but they're not really optimum. But if it goes to grade two and grade three mobility, then it's not really an option to actually put a veneer in that tooth because we all know that at some point that veneer is going to come off, that tooth is going to come off, and we don't want to lose that. Stable the periodontal condition first before you plan on doing anything. The patient has to understand that you have to control it, scaling and polishing, 
refer him to a periodontist, have periodontal therapy, come back, everything is stable, and that's where we can actually do the veneers. We need a stable dentition. We cannot work with a questionable dentition. After that, look at the teeth. Is there any crowding in the teeth themselves? Now, crowding means if we want to reach an optimum results, crowding might mean that we need to drill more of a tooth to actually get that result that we do want. Sometimes you get some patients with high crowding teeth and you look at them, it's like, if we're gonna do veneers on those teeth, we really need to drill your teeth and we're gonna, your teeth are gonna look like pegs before they put the crowns on. But it's not something that we do wanna do. I mean, as dentists, we want to be conservative. We don't really wanna destroy teeth. We wanna be as minimal as we can whenever we can. If, if, if there's too much crowding on there, you can refer the patient to an orthodontist, tell them if you wanna get the optimum results, go to the orthodontist, have some braces done or some aligners done, get your teeth straight and then we can do veneers. Of course, that's a patient's choice in the end. If the patient tells you, no, I don't wanna have veneers, I accept the fact that you need to drill my teeth, just drill my teeth and give me the smile that I want. Then that's a compromise actually. Uh, if the patient wants that, then he has to understand everything that goes on with it. The teeth are gonna lose their structure. You're more susceptible to root canal treatments and a decay in the future. And of course that will lessen the longevity of the teeth themselves. It's always better to go from a veneer to a crown to a root canal, then extraction, than going directly into a crown or even a root directly into a root canal and a crown. And then after that, you don't, if anything does happen, you kind of lose any leeway that you can to actually preserve the teeth. So the last thing we do look for as well is the spacing. Now spacings are beautiful and they're amazing to have when you're doing veneers. That means you don't really need to prepare the teeth much. If you can see that, uh, like a picture I've put over there, she has a lot of spacing between her teeth, all the way from the canines to the canines, there were a lot of spacing, there was a lot of work, uh, a lot of space to work with when we did the veneers. Uh, all we have to do is just roughen a little bit of the edges, get rid of the undercuts and then do the veneers. We don't really have to drill the teeth as much. We have all the space that we want. We just have to plan it properly. So it comes to designing. Now this is a picture that I found very interesting. It's beautiful, isn't that? I mean, the teeth look like chiclets. I hope, I really hope no one does this. Well, I really found it interesting when I was looking online. I mean, this is something that, well, we don't really want that. When it comes to designing teeth, there is no characteristic in that teeth. They're all bulky, there's nothing on them, they're not really that beautiful, they're not attractive. We don't want that in our results. And I really hope no one gets that in their results. So, talking about designing, now we've all been all to the veneer lectures over the years. Um, the template, this is the template that I've seen that's actually quite common when we do start doing veneers, and I've worked with this when I started doing those procedures. This is kind of the basic designs that we have that you can just communicate easier with the technician, gives you an idea, it's like, all right, that looks might look a bit better on the patient. That vigorous style might look uh, well for that. The oval, youthful, these are good templates to start with when we're starting our veneers. But we want to move beyond that. Designing gets a bit more personal. That's, that's one part I like about doing veneers, is it's the artistic part of yourself. Uh, the dentist yourself, you have to be artistic in it. Look at the patient, when you look at the patient, you think like, okay, that patient, okay, we might wanna do softened style, but maybe put sharp canine on it and pointy canine or reduce the lateral a little bit, one millimeter below the incisal edge of the central. These are things that come with time. You work with the basics and then you move forward from that. That's how you, you want to be unique in the end. Yeah? When you come and look at your work, you want to look at your work as something that you do love, not just put a template here, a template there. This is the critical thinking part of uh, doing veneers. And it's very, very artistic as well. So when you come to looking at the patient and want to design the teeth, look at their face. Look how their facial anatomy is. Do they have an oval face? Do they have a round face? Do they have a heart-shaped face, a square-shaped, a diamond? Look at their shin as well. Do you want to look at their nose? Do they have a prominent nose or do they have a small nose? And also look at their eyes. Do they have symmetrical eyes? Do they have long eyes? Do they have round eyes? All these kind of play factor 
and how you want to design your veneers because you want to look at the patient as a whole. You're not just looking at the teeth themselves and just you want to put the veneers on the patient and that's it. You, need, you want to look at the patient as a whole, as the face, because when they smile, first thing anyone's going to notice, they're going to notice their teeth. If the teeth look very smooth, if they coincide with the patient's anatomy, they will look beautiful, believe me. They will look very beautiful. They will look very natural. They will look white and natural. And the patients will love you for that. When he gets the comments from everyone that goes around, it's like, all right, I went to a party with my friends or I went here with my friends. I met some new people and they loved my teeth. They fit the personality. They fit the shape. And that's what we want in the end. That critical thinking. So when you look at the patient, symmetry of the patient, put a line in the middle of the patient from their forehead down to the middle of the shin, see how they look like. That's where you can adapt to why you want to design the teeth. Come into the part of, uh, well, the laboratory part of the veneers and your technician. Now, the technician plays a very big part and very important part when it comes to veneers. You want to have a communication. You want to have a relationship with your technician. It's not just you telling him do this and do that without taking input in consideration. And the same thing goes with your technician. So having a good one, having one that you can talk to is a very important thing. Include your technician in the process. When you're done with the preparation or when you're still doing in the planning phase, get the technician to come by as well, have a look at their teeth. That's something I used to do with my technician that I used to love. He was involved in every single case that I've done. Now, I was very lucky that he was just one floor up. I would just call him, he's just come down the stairs. That was very lucky I had that one. Well, when he gets involved, you look at the patient, you both look at the patient, he tells you that what he thinks, you tell him what you think, you tell him what you see and what you want to achieve, and then he can tell you if he can actually get that result for you. And you can't really ask something of your technician that can be out of their limit or out of their comfort zone. Nobody likes to work out of their comfort zone. If you have an, well, if you have a technician that's willing to try new things, willing to risk things, of course, that's a very good thing, but of course, keep the basics and the basics are very important, so you have to take that in mind. Uh, my technician, we were very experimental. We tried new things. We wanted to improve more and more on our work. We took that step. We, we used to work close together in the, in the lab as well. And I'm not saying you have to have that kind of relationship with your technician, but a give or take, discuss and communicate. When it comes to shade selection as well, if you're doing, uh, if you're not really doing a BL or a bleach kind of color to the teeth, you want to have uh, a central, you want to make it look like the centrals or the lateral next to it. We are good at taking the shades and there are, there have been some advancements in taking the shade. You can actually take the shade with an intraoral scanner these days if you have it in your clinic. But it's always good that the technician comes down or comes to your clinic, looks at the teeth next to them, looks at the, what he needs to do, if he needs to add translucency, any staining on the teeth, or you can even take pictures if your technician cannot come down. Dental photography is actually a very interesting uh, way to go as well. I would encourage anyone to actually take that course in dental photography. It will give you the basics of how you can actually catch the teeth in their natural being. So you can actually send it to the, to the technician and there will be a representation of what the teeth actually are in the patient. Uh, also, when it comes to the design we've spoken about, yes, to get the uh, get the technician, see what ideas he has, and uh, different designs that can fit your patient. You can play with the designs a bit here and there. You can have two, uh, two, three, or even four designs, but that's where the try-in phase comes in. You don't have to tell the technician to, all right, go in and press the ceramic, make the ceramic, and then you want to change the shape. It's always good to have the mock-up, the final mock-up, before you actually cast the ceramic. Put the index in put it in the patient, let him go home, see what he thinks about it. If, he, if the patient goes home, tells you, mm, no, not really that much, uh, the canines are a bit too sharp, I kind of bit on my lip yesterday. So that's something that you can change in before you permanently cast the veneers. Like I said, talk and listen to your technician, find out their limits. It's always good to find out what kind of technique they do use to make the veneers. Now, I've worked with uh, Manila technicians before. Some technicians, they use the CAD CAM milling machine for milling the uh, ceramic blocks. Um, some technicians use the lost wax technique. Now, personally, I prefer the lost wax technique when it comes to doing veneers and uh, 
press around next themselves because it uh, I found out that it gives me more of a control about what I want in the end about thickness and thinness how thin the veneers are it depends in the end of what you want if you want to do a cutback technique of course we do know you have to prepare the teeth more and you need more of a bulk that actually is to do the cutback technique in the end, if you're not happy with your technician, change him. There is no shame, and it doesn't break your relationship with the technician. I'm still on good terms with all the technicians I've worked with. Um, I've worked with a couple until I found the one that I really liked his work. It doesn't change your relationship. In the end, uh, it's a professional relationship. If your technician can give you what you want, you can find another technician that can give you what you want. Be in control in the end have to be in control. So after the technician partner, we do have, uh, it comes to lithium down silicate blocks, uh, the ceramics that we do use. Mainly we have feldspathic porcelain. Now that one is really used for really thin veneers. Uh, its strength is about 75 MA and it's not very really that strong, but it's very highly aesthetic. It's very technique sensitive as well. There's not many ceramics that can work confidently with feldspathic veneers. The other part would be the press ceramics, which are the little blocks over here, you can see them. Press ceramics, they are usually work more in bulk. Uh, they're more, they're stronger than the feldspathic veneers and they take, really take their bonding and their tension from the cement itself. Feldspathic, because it's thin, it really takes their tension from the tooth itself and how you prepare the tooth. Understanding what we can achieve with those different ceramics, understanding the materials that we do have is actually a very important part. Now, when it comes to press ceramic, the feldspathic is very, it's just like a powder and liquid. The technician mixes it and then layers it on the teeth itself. It has actually very good results, very aesthetic results. Uh, talking about press ceramic as well, with the different blocks that we have, we can achieve different results. Uh, we have uh, seven different blocks when it comes to press ceramic. We have the high translucency block, we have the medium translucency blocks, low translucency, and then we go into low opacity, medium opacity, and then high opacity blocks. And then finally, we have the multi-shade block itself. Now, it depends on what you want in the end, on how you want your results to be, or how the teeth look like in the start as well. They all affect what kind of blocks that you do want to use. Now, at the first, the first picture over here, that's a high translucency block that I have used. Now, that patient, that he wanted really white teeth. Um, we spoke about it, and then we chose to go for the high translucency, and those are actually bleach one shade. He's white, he's blonde, it worked perfectly. It's not in your face white bright. Now, because you wanna add characteristics to the teeth themselves. You don't want your patients to look like they have a toilet seat on their teeth. Well, that is not attractive. You wanna, the patient might be happy with it, but you want to be happy with the work that you've done as well. And you can see how the shade itself works on the teeth. They wear minimal prep. Uh, you can see how the shade works out. And then come into the medium, tra uh, medium translucency blocks. Now, of course, the more we go, the less translucency we have in the blocks. Now, that block, those ones were used as a BL2. That's a bleach two shade on that. Of course, combined with the cements, we're gonna talk about the cements in a little bit. Combined with the cements, you can get a more achievable result that you want. Cements play a big role when it comes to having thin ceramics and thin veneers. Now, uh, coming to low translucency blocks, you can look at this. This is a low translucency block at the bottom. That was done at a bleach three. You can see they are white, they are nice, but they're not in your face white and they adapt to the patient. I've always seen that when I look at my patients and I want to choose the shade that I want to choose, of course, we use this shade guide that we have. We use that one. I always try and look on the sclera of the eye. So if you look at the sclera of the eye, if the white that you do on your teeth matches the whiteness of the eye, the teeth will look natural. It's the moment that the teeth are actually whiter or brighter than your eye. That's where it looks more fake. But you want to give them something white, beautiful, and look natural at the same time. When they go out, when they go to their friends, you don't want them to go out and everyone they meet knows they have fake teeth. Now, unless the patient wants that, then that's the patient's option, to be honest, that's his choice. And then coming to low opacity blocks. Now I haven't used the low opacity block. Uh, when I first started doing veneers, I've worked mostly with medium and high opacity. 
and then as, as I've progressed, I've tried, started to changing the veneers I've used. So the medium opacity blocks, you can see, this is a bleach tool in the medium opacity blocks. You can see the difference between that bleach tool and the bleach tool in the middle there, the medium translucency. You can see the difference in how opaque they are. Of course, that depends on what if you have to work in. When it comes to opaque, you need opaqueness sometimes when you have dark shades on the teeth or when the teeth are yellow and really dark. When it comes to high opacity blocks, of course, those completely block the light because that's the whole point of opacity and translucency. There's the, well, the translucency to light itself and the ability of the ceramic to get the light through. High opacity blocks, they're really blocks of white. They block out light completely and they look really, really white. And that is actually a bleach too. So you can see this is actually quite white and really bright. Now, if the patient wants that, kudos to the patient, he's happy with it, then that's fine. But you want to ask yourself, are you happy with it? But when it comes to planning, the patient expectation, they give you an idea of what they want, of how you get it to the patient, that depends on you. You can either give them their expectations or you can actually give them something higher than their expectation, actually getting them go out the clinic happier than they came in, happier than they, what they thought they would be when what they had in mind. That's always, that's why I keep always my aim when I do those videos and do those cases. I won't give my patients something that they did not expect, something that throws them off the charts. And that's how you become kind of uh, etched in their memory forever. Uh, you want to reach that point where you know what's best. The materials that I have, I know what I want to get, and I am going to get it. The multi-blocks, now the only difference in multi-blocks is that it comes in different chains. You don't really have to do a cutback technique on them. You don't have to do anything on them. They come from a darker cervical third, lighter middle third, and then it goes to a translucent uh, cervical third. So the mammal ones are the anatomy of the teeth is actually already in the block itself. Uh, I haven't seen it on a bleach, but it's mostly used on A1s and A2s and B1s, more of an aesthetic approach as well. So always think and ask yourself, what do I have to work with? What is the substrate that I have to work with? Uh, do I, are they white teeth? Are they yellow teeth? How does the patient look like? Now the top right here, you can see the patient's natural teeth are actually quite dark and yellow. And that is not plaque. That's actually how the patient's teeth look like. So here you would think about, okay, I might use something a little bit less translucent you want to combine it with the right cements. We're going to talk about cements in a couple of minutes to actually cover that yellowness. And of course, thinking and taking in consideration that those teeth will get darker as time goes by. Teeth get darker, the dentine gets darker as we age. Uh, do we have down the middle left here? You can see the patient, uh, that shade was around C3 to C4. It's more of a gray to it and more gray a kind of uh, shade to it. So we need something more to block that. And that's actually the one I used for the low translucency block. So you can see this is what we've done with her at the end. She actually had a crown on those. So you, this tooth was a crown, but in the end you use breast ceramic. You don't want anything different. You don't want difference between veneers and crowns. So I chose to go for that one with the low translucency because I want to block out that little bit of a grayness and I know down the line she's going to have darker teeth and I don't want them to show. Yellow teeth, all these affect it. So think about what you have, what the substrate that you have, what, is, what can you do to make the case a little bit better. The one on the middle on the right here, that one <clears throat> we have chosen to do a gingivectomy for him uh, to actually get the results that we do want. Remember in the end, the patient has to be happy as well as you. So when we come to resin cement, we, what do we actually look like to the cement that we wanna use for in our treatments? Now we want it to be high in resistance to, high resistance to fracture. We want it to be aesthetic. We want it to be shade stable. We want it to resist marginal staining. We don't want a little bit of a brown line to look out there when it comes five, 10 years down the line. Of course, you can use oxidizers as well on the margin to actually reduce that one. You want it to be wear resistant. You don't want to have a lot of post-operative sensitivity with it and it needs to be strong and really hold on to the veneers as long as it can. So the most important part in the cement itself. Now there's something called the delta E factor. Now the delta E factor is usually the water absorption and the shade stability of the veneer cement itself over time. 
Now, this is a test that was conducted at University of Texas in San Antonio by Dr. Nasser Bargi. He took in a couple of uh, veneer systems. We have the Nexus, Ensure, Varilink, RelayX, the Choice. Now, you can see the delta E factor when you go to RelayX and Choice, they are quite down. Now, I'm not really promoting any product. If you're using something and you've been using it for a long time, works for you, shade doesn't change, you don't have to change it. But it's good to understand those kind of things when it comes to the materials. Now, the delta E factor being very low, that means that cement is not going to change color over time. So if you choose a B1 to cement, it's going to stay a B1 for years and years down the line. It's not going to become a B3. Or if you use a movie star or a really opaque uh, white cement, it's not going to darken over time. Now, each company has the same thing. I have worked with RelayX, I have worked with Verilink, uh, I have worked with Choice. Well, I've worked, I had my share into trying out the cements to actually see what I like to work with. What's something that you're comfortable to work with in the end of the day. You don't, we get, we get a sales representative coming to our clinics every day, everyone claiming that their veneer cement is the best there is. It's stable, it doesn't do that, it doesn't do this. We get that all the time. But when we do understand it, we can know if they are actually not really talking, they're not really saying the truth. Because in the end, they want to sell their product. I don't blame them, that's their job. We want to sell ourselves as well to the patient. So when it comes, there are a lot of veneers, uh, cements going out there, either it's light cure, or if you want to go and dual cure. Now I have gone, to, I've used many of them, like I said, but I've the fav most favorite one that I have used is the Mojo veneer cement. Now that cement is like super glue and it does not change color. I've worked with RelayX veneer over time as well. I've had issues with debonding over time. I think a year or two years as well, I've had uh, some veneers that debonded from the veneer itself, from the cement itself. The tooth is clean, the veneer is clean, you can just see that the cement has come off. Now the module, like I said, it gives you a choice of colors, clear, light, dark, movie star, which is high block white. I have worked with very link veneer, the mixable ones where you mix the two tubes and then you put it on the patient. Now that one is not really high, uh, stable, shade stable at the end. Choice two is actually quite good as well, it's stable. It all depends on what you like to use and what you're comfortable to use. Now, coming to dual cure itself, now the very link aesthetic, of course, the dual cure is the ideal thing that we do want to use. Um, we can just put them on. They're very strong when it comes to bonding strength as well. The light cure veneer cements, they're actually very strong as well, but not, uh, compared to the dual cure, the dual cure is always a lot stronger. Very link aesthetic, they do have a range of the shades that they have on. Breeze is actually also from the Mojo company. So they have a dual cure uh, version of uh, their material. And you got the Relay X Unisim Automix as well. It comes in different shades. But as I have seen, the Relay X, they're very limited on the shades that you can get when it comes to veneers. Because you want to play around with what shade you put on. When you have translucent veneers, the light passes through and the shade of the veneer will go through as well. So if you want your veneers to actually look a little bit whiter, you can actually use the light cement. Now when it comes to, when I used to use the, the Mojo for my veneers, uh, the Movie Star one, I haven't used it as much because it's really block white. It can actually take a medium translucent veneer block and make it into a, a medium opacity. So that's something I have to think about as well when you experiment with the materials. I always like to use the light. Clear, I used it a little bit depending on the patient cells, but the, the downside of using a clear cement is that down the line, the teeth are going to get darker and it will show and the veneers are going to get darker over time. So you want something that's more of a medium there to preserve that color over time, hold it there for a longer time. I don't want my veneers to be darker in five years. I want the patient to be happy for 10 to 15 years with the same teeth. They're very nice. They're not getting darker. They come for a cleaning every now and again and they're very happy. That's what I want in the end. I'm not really concerned about the results at the moment. I know I'm going to give them good results, but we want to think about the future, something more stable in the future itself. You know, we don't want to have deep bonding. We don't want to come back and waste our time into rebonding the veneers or the patient swallowed the veneer, lost the veneer, we have to make them another veneer. Those are things that we don't want. Well, patient factors play a big role as well. So that's all to take in consideration when you are doing your planning. <clears throat> so, um, we're almost coming to the end of the presentation now. All right.
So when it comes to choosing the resin cements, it's important to understand what we can achieve and what material that we do have. Now, the resin cement plays a part. Of course, your etching and bonding system also plays a part what you do on the tooth. Now, the light cure, we all know it's photo activated. It's activated by light. Of course, you have more working time. It doesn't cure on its own. You have time to place the veneers, you put them where you want, make sure they fit right before you light cure them. And it gives you more time. It's more color stable as well. Now, of course, we use them for aesthetic restorations, metal free restorations, and thin translucent veneers or ceramics. Because if you can't really reach with the light to that depth, we cannot really use light cure in thick ceramics or crowns, for example, or BFMs. Next one is the dual cure cements. Of course, they are photo activated and chemically activated. They have high bond strength. They're very aesthetic and they're very easy to use. But the thing is you have less working time. It's good for cementing thick ceramic, opaque ceramics, metal free restorations, even metal restorations. I've worked with the Relight X dual cure and we actually use it for cementing BFM crowns and it holds on perfectly. And the last one is the fully chemical cure and this one Cures on its own, it's very good to use in endodontic poles, metal restorations, or in areas where you can't really reach with your light cure. When it comes to adhesive systems and etching systems, and we do have the total etch. Now, of course, that's where we etch the teeth with phosphoric acid, and then we do the bonding, and then we put the cement and we bond it, the veneers. It's very excellent, gives you very excellent bond strength. This is the one I like to use. I like to have control of each step. It has reduced micro leakage, more steps to reduce micro leakage, of course. You, are, you can predict it long term, but it's a multi step application technique. It is time consuming. Uh, after that, we get to the self etch. The self etching primer, you don't really have to etch the teeth. You just put the primer on, leave it on, just uh, well, put a little bit of air on it, light cure, and then you can just cement the veneer and put the cement. It's very easy to use, it's less technique sensitive, it still gives you a good bonding strength. Now, the last one is the self-adhesive, and that's something that we do see in the Real IX, which is dual cure cements, they're self-adhesive cements. So the phosphoric acid is actually put into the resin. You don't have to etch. You can do selective etching of the teeth, but you don't have to etch, you don't have to bond. You just have to prepare the veneer surface, put your saline on it, leave it for a minute, and then put the veneer cement and put it on the tooth. Uh, you can bond it on treated teeth. Like I said, you can do selective etching as well to it. So that is a kind of the part of the materials I do want to talk about. Now, I want to leave you with a little something for the end, a little bit of tips to improve. Be critical of your work. So that's the kind of ideas that when I first started uh, five years ago, I used to think these are really good. This is what I want to do. Now, the patients were very happy, but I wasn't happy with my work. Uh, I looked at them and I looked, they were too white. They were too bulky. Uh, I didn't like the shape. So the patients were happy though, but I'm not. So I wanted to improve myself. And that's something you have to be critical on your own work if you want to improve yourself in the future. Always find something that you can improve on until you reach the point where it's perfect. Because that's what you want in the end. You want to be very happy. You want to finish your day. You want to go home. And it's like, oh, I'm really happy. I've done this case today. The patient was very happy. And I'm very happy with the work I've done. So you want to take it from there, from those kind of uh, results. And you want to get to a result that you are happy with. You want to take your practice to the next level. You want to know the materials that you're using, improve yourself, uh, go on courses. I was very fortunate with the courses that I've went on um, with the people I have uh, been in contact with. They are very amazing people uh, in Dubai. Um, the courses I've gone, I've gone to a multiple of courses. They're very good. If you want to know the courses, I can give you the details of them later. I've learned a lot from them. I've learned a lot from my technician. Like I said, you want to go from something you're not happy with to something that you and the patient would be happy to present, to give, and for something for you want people to see out in daylight. You want them to be seen out in the public. Going from those, going into a better and more beautiful result in the end. You want to have that uh, uniqueness. You want to have that characteristic about your veneers that makes you stand out from anyone around you or any dentist around you. And that's what you want in the end, self-improvement. And of course you want to go forward. So those are my references for the lecture. I hope everyone enjoyed my lecture. 
Um, we do have a small uh, video from Dentist, Ch Dentist Channel Online. They have a smaller presentation for you. And then we can move on to the questions of Q&A. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Mahanad. It was a fantastic session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and warm welcome once again on behalf of Team Dentist Channel Online. Sorry, I couldn't connect with you a little earlier in start because of a heavy downpour in my beautiful city, Mumbai, who's facing a, a heavy rainfall today and hence we are having a, a internet and Wi-Fi issue. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, nevertheless, I would want to know from you how you found this lecture. I'm sure you found it fantastic, awesome, beautiful and all those good adjectives. Still, I would want to know from you how you found the lecture whether you found the lecture was very interesting, whether you'd want Dr. Mohanad to conduct a course or whether he would, whether if you would want him to have it for another webinar or for many webinars, for whatever we want, want to know it from you. So please put your comments in the chat box so that we know how you felt about the webinar. Dr. Dr. Mohanad requests you to kindly stop your screen share for a moment. All right, let me just do that. Okay, did it go? Not yet. All right. All right, thank you very much. Yes, dear participants, I want from each and every one of you a short comment as to how you found the presentation. Oh yes, we are getting those messages. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Those really mean a lot to me and I'm sure to Dr. Mohanad as well. Oh yes, yes Dr. Mohanad, I hope you enjoyed we are, it. Yeah. We're getting messages of uh, courses, so I'm sure if you conduct some courses, a participant would love to oh, attend to all your courses. I'm loving the feedback. I hope the message that I wanted, I hope everyone had, well, get well, well, the message that I wanted to get through. Thank you all for the comments. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your lovely comments. I'm sure uh, those comments will help us to uh, have, a, have many more webinars and definitely a course that you all are asking us on demand. Uh, we will quickly work on the course a little later and we will get back to you with a beautiful course module. So please do stay in touch with us. Uh, we are dentistchannel.online. For most of y'all who don't know who we are, we are a dental media company and we cater exclusively to the dental fraternity from dental events, workshops, courses, symposiums, uh, online expos, etc. We have a lot in store for you, only for our dear dental professionals. And yes, we request you, we urge you to stay in touch with us by following us on our social media platforms so that you know what's going to happen next uh, the next updates from us when it comes to events, webinars, etc. Please do follow dentistchannel.online. Please share the love and please let everybody know who we are. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, for all those budding as well as experienced implantologists out there, this is a one of its kind virtual implant expo taking place from the 17th to the 22nd of August this year which is the next month. I want you to be a part of this absolutely free of course. You can register for the scientific sessions, for the masterclass sessions, and for the many sessions that we've specially curated for all your budding as well as experienced implantologists. This is the implant expo you would definitely not want to miss. We have stalwarts and master implantologists from all across the globe coming on this platform and delivering power packed scientific presentations and lectures only for you. So this is the Implant Expo, like I've mentioned earlier. Please do register for the Expo and the registration is absolutely free of course. You can register to any of the events that you like of your choice. To know more about the Expo, you can log on to www.dentistchannel.online slash Implant Expo. This Expo is not just for the experienced implant lodges, but this is for the ones who wish to come get into implant logy. We have right from the basics to advanced of implant logy covering all aspects of implant logy from conventional implant logy to the modern implant logy from zygoma to pterygoid to each and every topic from implant logy is going to be covered during the six days of the world's first virtual dental implant expo organized by your very own dentist channel dot online. So please do register for the expo. We also are looking out for ambassadors for the expo. It's a very simple uh, task that task that we are expecting from you and that is to spread the word of the expo and I'm sure many of us would want to be a part of the expo to benefit by listening to stalwarts and master speakers. 
please do become an ambassador of the expo the only thing that you have to do is you have to spread the word and be an influencer and let mm-hmm. others everybody know what the expo is so if you wish to be an ambassador or if you wish to know more about the expo you can message us on the below mentioned whatsapp number thank you for joining us for this webinar once again uh, for all our prime members we we have a special e certificate for you for attending this webinar and for the ones who are not prime members yet please do uh, register with dentistchannel.online as a prime member of dentistchannel.online if you also want to become a prime member of dentistchannel.online you can message us on the below mentioned whatsapp number and this is about the next webinar next webinar is on the topic clinical tips and tricks in restoring smiles if you're interested to register for this webinar you can find the registration link in the chat box below thank you my name is ruben and i had a pleasure hosting this session we now start with the most important session that is the live question and answer session we start with the first question question from dr yashika jain yeah all right let's start so all right so dr yashika is saying do we make changes in veneers or avoid veneers completely if patient has clenching or bruxism well you don't really avoid veneers even if the patient has a clenching or bruxism habit you just adjust and you make the patient understand that he has this habit and he has to wear the splint that you're going to make at the end the patient has to wear, understand that they will affect the veneers and that's why you make the splint you it, you want to protect your veneers you want to protect the, the muscles you want to protect the occlusion itself so you don't avoid veneers completely, but the patient has, you have to tell him where the splint that you're going to make him in the end. We have to have that one. Thank you, sir. And Next question answer. from Dr. Ayman Fatima. Does high translucency block, uh, block look natural? Uh, when it comes to, well, uh, when it comes to translucency, it's, um, yes, it might look more natural, but all depends on how you want your results to look in the end. High translucency will get let the light go through a lot more, and it will kind of uh, give you a shadow of the bottom teeth, the teeth un underlying the veneers themselves. Uh, they can look more natural. The whiteness of it is a little bit more dull than the opaque uh, blocks, but yes, it looks more natural. To me personally, I like to use the medium translucency block more than the high translucency block to get a more natural result. Thank you. So next question from Dr. Pratik Pal. Which type of occlusion should be there? Should it be canine guided or group function? Uh, when we talk about occlusion, there's nothing that should be there because each patient is quite different in their occlusions and the occlusion scheme that they come in. Of course, we want the occlusion scheme to be at the canine guidance. That would be the optimum one. But if they have other occlusion schemes, and that doesn't change the fact, we just have to adapt that contact points and the pressure that when we come to designing our veneers. Hope thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm sure the question was answered. Next question from Dr. Deepika. Is there any special consideration or procedures to be done in deep bite cases before giving veneers? Now, deep bite cases, when it comes to them, there's nothing that you can do unless you actually send the patient to orthodontic treatment or if you send him to a specialist. Well, consideration when it comes to designing the veneers or the contact points of how you want your incisal edge of the bottom teeth to hit on the top teeth, either it's on the gum itself or is it sitting on the cingulum itself and what's the type of the deep bite. Some patients are not really bothered with it. It actually gives you more of a freedom that you tell the patient, all right, we don't need to do uh, veneers on the bottom teeth for now. We'll do the top ones. If you're happy with them, we don't really need to do the bottom ones. Thank you, sir. Next question, once again, from Dr. Deepika. Is it a good option to treat gummy smiles using veneers? Um, that also, that, that uh, planning when it comes to that, it also depends on the patient themselves. If they have a gummy smile, of course, you have to tell the patient that, all right, you have a gummy smile. When you smile, you're going to see the gums. Uh, when it comes to you, you want to make sure that the gums are healthy. You can still do veneers on them. You can uh, propose to the patient a, little, a couple of procedures that you can refer them to a surgeon to get that gummy smile fixed. You can do gingivectomies if you have lasers. If you don't have a laser, you can always refer him to someone who has lasers and he can do that procedure for you. Of course, if you have that space to work with, I've done gingivectomies on the patients when I felt the need that their gums can be higher, it gives me a better result. And the patient, they accept it and they were very happy. Um, I'll just show you quickly, if you go on, just 
bit stuck. So the top picture on the left, now that one was a, gummy, a bit of a gummy smile. Even the bottom one on the left, but it's not as bad of a gummy smile. But the top one on the left, we've done a, a gingivectomy for him and his pre-picture was actually here. So that one was the middle picture on the right. Just waiting for it. Yep, so that was him on the middle on the right. You can see the gummy, you can see it. So we've done a little bit of gingivectomy. You can still do it if you have the material. You can even do the gingivectomies with a scalpel, carpal scalpel, you can do that as well. You don't have to have lasers. Lasers are good for homeostasis to actually control the bleeding and the healing as well is a lot faster. You need to wait a longer healing when you do it with a scalpel and the blade. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Next question, a very good question from Dr. Agarwal. If the patient is an MMA fighter or a boxer, what do you do in that case? Well, if he's a fighter, he, we do know that he's, he was going to get hit in the face a lot. <clears throat> and if, the, if he really wants to have veneers, you can still do veneers for them, but they have to have a really durable mouth guard, a really durable one so they don't break their teeth. But they have to understand that in their fighting, when they're going out in the ring, they might get hit in the face and they might break some of their teeth and they might need to do some more work. But a mouth guard would be a big, big, big yes for that one. Thank you, sir. The next question is in Arabic. I'm not sure if you'd be able to. Um, no, uh, it's Mr. Anwar. He's asking about well, what's the optimum time to do an implant and the best kind. Um, the implants, when it comes to implants, we're not really discussing the implants at the moment. But usually you have to wait around three months after extraction of the teeth to actually place an implant for the healing to happen. Um, there was another question. Uh, just sorry, uh, Ruben. Uh, Maria Motiwala, she asked, what was the technique you mentioned for veneers? I was just a little bit uh, confused by the question. I'm just waiting for her to reply back about saying, what was the technique you mentioned for veneers? Right. It's, it's more or less like an answer that she is uh, answering to. to. Right. Uh, Maybe not... Dr. Maria Motiwala, I request you to reframe your questions and resend your question. I would really like to answer that one if she's still there. All right. I believe with that, we come to the end of the live question and answer session. Once again, Dr. Mohanad, on behalf of the entire team of dentistchannel.online and also on behalf of the participants, I would like to thank you for an amazing presentation. My name is Ruben. I had a pleasure hosting this session. Goodbye and may you all have a good evening.